first of all, thank you for thank you all for coming, and uh, it's an honor to give a, a talk here. Last time I was in Amsterdam was uh, 1991, uh, 26 years ago. A lot of people were really young at that time, and you know? I feel I'm too old. Uh, well, oh, the reason why we're doing Elastos, uh, we I, I've been doing this project for 18 years. Uh, when I started this project, I had uh, only one thing in mind, which is to build a network operating system. And uh, at that time, I didn't realize it, it took so long. And uh, now uh, I'm looking at the issue from uh, a different uh, uh, direction, from uh, uh, the uh, blockchain and uh, uh, cryptocurrency angle and looking at the issue. And uh, first of all, when we talk about, uh, I, I, I ran into blockchain in 2016. Uh, actually, I met uh, Vitalik, I met uh, Da Hongfei, and uh, most of the uh, Chinese blockchain community members, I uh, almost interviewed uh, uh, almost all of them in 19, no, 2016. So I heard a term, several terms. Uh, first of all, Ethereum was saying something like a world computer which make me interested because I was still I was doing the network as a computer, right? Because uh, uh, 1992, uh, actually last time, around the last time I came to Amsterdam, uh, the Java programming language was invented and uh, the goal for Java programming language was doing something called uh, the network is the computer. I don't know how many people remember that. You know, it's been 26 years, right? And uh, of course, uh, six years later, in uh, 1998, Microsoft started to do this uh, .NET project. And uh, I, I was lucky enough to be uh, one of the early uh, team member of Microsoft design team. At that time, we were trying to design a network OS, basically trying to say uh, the network is the computer, whether the computer needs an operating system. Right, and uh, actually, that caused me to uh, leave Microsoft eventually and found uh, the project Elastos because uh, at that time, uh, people were saying that uh, we do it in virtual machines, Java virtual machine versus uh, C sharp virtual machines, or Microsoft call it CRR, Common Language Runtime. I believed uh, very strongly to do it uh, in native, in C plus plus, because I thought uh, there are two fundamental flaws of uh, Java. One is that uh, Java, uh, even though it's uh, I mean, put a buzzword in, Java was uh, is Turing complete. You know, I don't really like the word, but then since blockchain uh, folks use the word, uh, I'm using the same word. Um, basically, Turing equivalent uh, doesn't mean much. It just means uh, programmable. Uh, of course, Java is programmable, and uh, but then. The first flaw of Java is that Java cannot run 100% of programs. Even if, even if it's Turing complete, it still cannot run 100% of the programs. In theory, it could, but in real reality, it can't because uh, people, no one uses Java to do uh, deep learning. No one uses Java to, uh, to do multimedia codecs, and uh, no one uses Java to implement Java virtual machine, <laughs> for example, right? That's a recursive question. Now somebody has to implement the Java virtual machine. And um, that said, for those programmers has to do the native programming, the CPU instruction programming, Java provides something called a JNI, basically giving a uh, backdoor to the programmer. So Java virtual machine actually was built to run applications and to make not only the developer's life much easier, but also guarantee the security because of the uh, from a virtual machine, it's very hard to tamper with the uh, hardware resources, hard to uh, embed uh, viruses into the native na native OS, right? But then if you have a uh, backdoor called a JNI going to Linux, uh, your all bets are off. You can still uh, launch viruses, do vir uh, uh, launch DDoS attacks, and launch uh, viruses. And uh, then why should we invent uh, Java virtual machine in the first place? Um, then people are saying, because uh, Java was um, machine uh, agnostic, so you can do it uh, running on ARM, running on uh, x86, running on MIPS, which 
even as early as 20 years ago, 1998, we know it's a myth. And uh, I personally don't believe it because of, think about it, how many CPUs are x86 or ARM? I'll tell you, 100% of the PCs are x86. Then why do you need a JIT, right? And 100% of the phones, I mean, give or take, that is a fraction. 99%, 99% dot nine something percent of phones are ARM-based, believe it, right? And 99.999% of the PCs are x86. When why should we spend time, you know, less than fraction of a percent of the users on PC, running PC? Why should we do JIT, right? And uh, second floor of Java is that uh, it's not end-to-end. -end. Java has something that C++ does not, does not have. Java has something called a class information. If you compile Java, compile into .cls or class. And that means Java has built in uh, metadata. What, how should we use metadata? Of course, Java uses metadata to enumerate through uh, data structures. Uh, more importantly, we can rely on metadata to generate ne network packet. So then no one is allowed from a Java virtual machine to directly touch the internet. All the traffic should be uh, generated. That way we can uh, we raise the bar for uh, network attacks. And also without capability of using the network, um, it's very hard to steal consumers uh, data and, uh, and send it uh, somewhere else. So that said, uh, as early as 20 years ago, actually, we knew uh, uh, legally how it, 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 there, there's a possibility to solve the problem. So that's why we started this project called .NET. And uh, I strongly believe in doing it in, in native code. And uh, that's why I found this uh, uh, project doing uh, a network OS in native code. Uh, this project has been going on a very, very long time. But then when I look at uh, world computer, when I look at uh, Ethereum or other smart contracts, people are referring something like uh, on-chain, off-chain. There are some things can be done by the smart contracts because that's a very novel, very creative uh, new way of programming. When you write something, it's verified on multiple nodes because people don't uh, trust each other. They check and balance each other's uh, computation results. Uh, but that said, still, there's a performance issue and also, definitely there are limitations for this kind of uh, uh, programming environment. Uh, for example, um, last night, uh, Belgium played soccer with uh, England. And if you want to know the result, right? Uh, you write a smart contract, we bet on it. And then, so you write, we, we write a smart contract, we bet like uh, 100 uh, either. Then where do you get the result? You go off chain to find the result. And uh, then there are so many different uh, blockchains running smart contracts, but they all talk about on-chain, off-chain, on-chain, off-chain. All the off-chain together, what is that off-chain? It's the web. You know, you cannot solve something on the blockchain, you go off-chain. Actually, you are going to the web, correct? But then, since the web we know of, the reason why, you know, 20 years ago we wanted to do a network OS, because of the network that no one can trust. The network of, uh, uh, network, internet was invented, uh, start, the research of internet started in 1969, which is almost, right, 50 years ago. And, uh, at that time, you know, it's matured in the early 80s and changed the name from Uppernet to Internet. That's um, 83, 84, when I went to the United States to do grad study. But then, Internet today still is decentralized. Decentralized meaning anybody with a server can connect to the Internet. If you know someone already on the Internet, you, can, you, you have a machine, connect to that machine, you are part of the Internet. It's very much like a, a blockchain. There are so many nodes and you can have one more, 
uh, miners and attached to the network, so you're adding more, right? No one saying no to you, and uh, so it's uh, decentralized. But on the other hand, because of the internet is decentralized, and, uh, and anybody can get on, you don't know who's who. There's no ID for the internet. And also, no one knows whether the DNS server resolution is correct because of there's always middleman hacked your, your router, your, you know, uh, this uh, along the road and uh, change your uh, uh, DNS. Then you think it's the ESPN.com, you think it is, you know, giving you the correct scores, but you may not reach the ESPN you intended to reach, right? And uh, so we bet on the soccer game. Uh, what if the result is fake? And uh, and then there's no intermediary to complain to. Then who is? And when you find out, actually, uh, it's a wrong result, and it's already too late, and you have no one to complain to. So what I'm saying is, off-chain is really not reliable and uh, not trustworthy. Even though the blockchain may maybe, but then the off-chain, when the off-chain is not trustable, actually all bets are off. You cannot really do any of those. Uh, uh, betting on the blockchain, right? Even though, you know, people are saying can do demos, it's just they are not hacking your servers hard enough. Because hacking a server for the professionals, uh, actually it's not that hard. I've seen some demos, people really literally hack your PCs just like, just like that, right? And um, what I'm saying is that that's why we need a safer internet so that's why we see we're saying something like a smart web powered by the blockchain. Why the smart web? Why it's smart web? Why powered by blockchain? The blockchain on the internet, we have multiple parties, multi organizations that uh, they don't trust each other, and you don't know who is who. But then we do trust the uh, uh, blockchain, say Ethereum or uh, Bitcoin, for that matter, and. Uh, one thing we have to be clear, uh, the blockchain, implementation-wise, the blockchain is decentralized. It has so many nodes, and uh, anybody can put a, a mining machine to it. But on the other hand, jointly, all the mining machines, or the mining pools, building one ledger, right? Blockchain, or no, Bitcoin, or Ethereum. They're building one ledger. So logically speaking, one ledger can never be decentralized. I don't know how many of you are aware, right? This phone at least has a quad CPUs built in. So from the chief architect point of view, they open up this phone, there are so many CPUs, right? And uh, they are distributed. I'm not talking about decentralized in the phone, but uh, logically speaking, that's one computer. So what I'm saying is one ledger we can trust more than uh, Bank of America's ledger, but still, it's a one ledger. One ledger, we can put, on more, put in more trust. Doesn't mean the ledger is decentralized. The ledger is not decentralized. The ledger is centralized. That's very, very clear common sense. And what uh, the ledger, the blockchain, can decentralize is that all the players of the internet, they don't trust each other. Let's say there are five big player, players, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook. Do they trust each other? Who's the bigger brother here, right? And then can they talk to one another saying, hey, if we cannot trust one another, and can we trust that blockchain give us IDs? Because it, that blockchain may not be manipulated by any of the five big players. So what I'm saying is, with the trust, we can make the network decentralized. The blockchain itself actually is not decentralized. For example, if we have a crypto, crypto kitty, crypto kitty actually is running on some centralized server if you know doing all the uh, computation logics the hybridization of uh, different uh, dnas and also when you generate uh, a offspring the offspring dna is uh, registered on the blockchain but then 
then it's used by a user on a browser. So there are basically three things. The logic is on the server, cloud server, and the uh, provenance is tracked on a, a blockchain and uh, a browser from here. So if you have a million users, logically it's a star uh, architecture, right? So everybody is going that way. It's not really decentralized, not peer-to-peer, -peer, logically. So that's why they couldn't sustain, you know, if it's a centralized server, if it's a centralized ledger, can it support a million customers? Can it support a billion customers in China? Think about it, right? No matter how fast is your ledger, no matter how fast your machine, it's impossible. One machine cannot solve the internet problems. That's just as simple as that, because one machine, no matter how fast, it cannot solve the uh, internet problems. So when I hear people talk about, uh, okay, my uh, blog, my uh, blood Bitcoin is uh, got this many uh, TPS per second, it's more like a joke. Have anybody asked the TPS of internet? Have anybody asked the TPS of Linux? Then why should we ask the TPS of, of course, if we compare, remember in early uh, 90s, we do when we assemble a, a PC ourselves, saying, okay, how many CPUs do you have? What's your clock cycle? How, many, how much memory do you have? Remember those good old days? You know, now it's, people are just buying a computer and don't ask anymore, but we used to, right? Always ask the vendor, oh, how many CPU? What's your clock cycle? And then basically that's asking how many TPS do you have? Every time you ask TPS, you ask about one computer. You're asking, so when, when something, somebody brag about they are doing this many of TPS, basically they brag about, I have a computer better than yours, correct? And I'm not saying who's uh, better, who's worse. What I'm saying is no matter how good you are, one computer cannot solve the world problems. That's just as simple as that. You need a, a a network. You have all the ledgers interconnect. You have all the parties interconnect. You have all the machines interconnect. Google.com. Can you imagine Google.com to us everyday consumers? Google.com. Google.com equivalent to one supercomputer super fast. Vast amount of memory. Correct. But internally, actually, Google.com is built of millions of PCs, you know, in the cloud center. So in turn, behind the doors, behind Google.com, there are millions of PCs. But to us, that's just one computer. That's two point of view we should take. What I'm saying is, no matter how many PCs are there, out there for a blockchain, they, they consist of millions of uh, boards or mining machines. But to us, that's just one computer. And also that computer is not designed as uh, Google.com. It's not designed for distributed uh, computing. Distributed computing meaning I cannot do the work. I ask helpers. I ask a million helpers to help, to search. Doing it in parallel, doing it faster. But blockchain is I have a million computers don't trust each other. And I did the calculation and you want to repeat my calculation. Right? So that the goal of blockchain actually is not for speed, it's for trust. So it's a completely different goal from like Google.com versus a blockchain. One is called a distributed system in terms of uh, computer science. One is called a decentralized to establish trust. In the blockchain world, people always interchange the two words. They don't distinguish the two words. Oh, uh, distributed ledger or decentralized ledger. Nevertheless, that's not what we're arguing. We are saying that um, the problem we're solving actually is the internet problem. We're not solving the blockchain problem. The blockchain is a new mechanism which can help us to establish a trust of the internet. Because Ledger itself doesn't have a trust problem. They all install the same software. Let's say you have millions of PCs install Windows. Do they trust each other? Of course they do, they are all made by Microsoft, right? But then what's their trust is all the mining machines, it's uh, 
uh, say Ethereum or Bitcoin, can they establish trust on the internet? That's the issue we are trying to uh, uh, address or trying to, uh, I don't know, trying to explain, right? Because uh, I thought this is uh, simple and uh, somebody should stay on, uh, stand on stage and say it clear and loud. Um, may not uh, please everyone, but uh, that's what I truly believe. That said, given that we are building a, a peer-to-peer -peer network, we call it a decentralized carrier, that peer-to-peer -peer network actually is equivalent to something like a Orange or a Verizon, because we have to uh, do the heavy lifting to transmit video phone-to-phone, peer-to-peer, and uh, transferring files like BitTorrent, BitTorrent transfer file, file peer to peer, and transferring uh, messaging, uh, remittance, uh, gaming, right? Those are all need to be peer to peer uh, transferred. And uh, that kind of network, as I said, can we make it autonomous running? Given the understanding of a blockchain, with the uh, miners mining the coins, the side effect of it, the Bitcoin is running autonomously. So given that, it's like a bootstrap. It's like the phone. We use uh, the fingerprint reader. We call it, uh, people call it T or uh, trust zone. Apple call it, Intel call it T and uh, ARM call it uh, trust zone. And uh, the machine actually is booted up from here, from the trust zone. The fingerprint reader, the data actually stayed uh, stored up. On, in the trust zone because of the, your finger, fingerprint data is not really stored on your hard drive, afraid of uh, your machine being infected by virus and read your uh, fingerprint data away. So actually the fingerprint reader is a computer by itself built inside of the CPU, ARM CPU. What I'm saying is that uh, there are so many CPUs for different reasons and uh, one of them is the trust zone. When we turn on the power, that's the machine starts uh, uh, first. And then with that trust, they sign each of the uh, kernel modules and uh, system modules and application modules and boot up that way, right? With a sequence of trust. So what I'm saying is that uh, Bitcoin, the blockchain actually is the trust zone of the smart web we're building. So that's where we can have trust, but actually we're building a new internet, peer-to-peer -peer internet. And of course, we issue IDs and uh, we keep track of provenance and uh, we issue uh, tokens for scar uh, scarcity and we run smart contracts at the user level. So those are the logics behind uh, Elasto's project. In terms of uh, milestones, uh, we, we have uh, Elasto's uh, public chain running December of uh, last year, and uh, we have uh, ELA tokens traded uh, February 1st on Hobby Exchange. And uh, in April timeframe, we released uh, the peer to peer carrier network. Currently, it's on GitHub. In May, we had a first uh, hackathon to design something very simple text mode, decentralized uh, messaging. So you can think of it uh, like uh, very rough versions of decentralized Telegram. And uh, we also released uh, open source code for the cloud drive. So then you have a phone, you can talk to the NAS, the storage uh, behind your router at home. You can actually uh, store and uh, retrieve your files from your personal storage. And we're also working with partners on IPFS to delivering contents faster to showing off video. We are going to release uh, decentralized IDs, as I said, uh, for this uh, carrier uh, by, and by the end of this month. So we're literally talking about in three to four days or less. Uh, we are going to release uh, decentralized IDs to our partners, to uh, the decentralized carrier to do uh, our partners. So then the decentralized carrier can install, can combine the decentralized carrier with the uh, DID and giving you a kind of like a decentralized orange on the, on the internet, right? So uh, that meaning the phone numbers are not issued by some central organization. The phone numbers actually are generated from that uh, 
uh, blockchain that we can all trust. It's not really a full number, it's a, it's a hash, right? it's a number, right? And then we are also building the virtual machines so then they can talk to one another, find one another through this uh, new kind of hash or phone number. They can find each other and then they can, do, uh, they can watch videos. So we're building a new smart web browser, which is the browser without HTTP, without uh, network, without letting users, applications directly open up a socket. Yet through those IDs, like phone numbers, you dial to another virtual machine and all the communication channels, all the network traffic are generated and carried out by the decentralized carrier. And uh, that demo actually is working in the lab right now. We're going to release an alpha version by the end of uh, August. So the whole smart web alpha will be released in August. And by the end of the year, we expect to release a beta version of this smart web, um, which is uh, we're going to work with customer uh, uh, partners to issue to install at least uh, forty thousand uh, like uh, set-top boxes or smart routers or smart speakers, those home devices in real homes for testing of this peer-to-peer uh, -peer network. We're going to have around uh, four hundred thousand users using like uh, decentralized. Uh, applications, for example, decentralized uh, Zapier, which is the uh, short video social network. And uh, we're working with them to exercise this uh, alpha versions of the decentralized web. Finally, the reason why we call it the smart web is because of the web. Last web was a web of information, web of data. Now we're saying it's a web of code web of binary executables. So with the URL, you're pointing to executables, like instant apps, right? You click, the program runs. With the current operating system, if you do that, you uh, incur uh, viruses. And how can you build a virtual machine not uh, finding out viruses? Finding virus, of course, is very important, but more importantly, we want to build an internet of value. What's the internet of value based on powered by blockchain? When you transfer something on the social network, ask yourself, you're transferring data, you're transferring photo, you're transferring video, you're transferring uh, web pages, correct? They're all data. But if you want to transfer something valuable, something worth you paying for, you have to transfer something with scarcity. Because if you can freely copycat as many as you want, you cannot sell for too much. But then if there's only 1,000 of uh, your ebook in circulation, maybe that's worth something, right? It's like a limited amount of books, limited amount of uh, any merchandise. Then you can make it uh, a digital asset. So to do that, we have to turn that into binary. And the binary, the reason why it's binary, because binary run itself. And how many times it's being executed, where it's being executed, the author would know. And also, every time it's executed, the virtual machine will get, get a chance to load it and check against the blockchain. Do you still own that property? If it's a digital property, you have all the bits on your hard drive. But if you, you sold it to me, it's re-encrypted on the blockchain. So if you run the same bits, the virtual machine will say, no, you don't own it anymore. So that's how we build the so-called uh, value internet. So many people talk about value internet. They're only talking about, OK, now they can register the copyright or property right of your book. But without guarantee that nobody can parse your, your asset, actually, you're not talking about value internet. That's what we feel the project, the Elastos project, which is so unique in the world, doing value internet. Thank you very much.